Welcome. In this discussion, we're going to have a little bit of an introduction to the basics of curriculum design. It's guided strongly by the readings that we've been doing in this course for this week. And I really hope that you're going to watch this video discussion before you read the article that's been assigned to you for this week. So first of all, when we talk about curriculum design, we talk about the following components of it. What are the objectives as well as goals? What's the content of your curriculum? What are the learning experiences for your students? And how will you evaluate whether learning is taking place? And what changes are you then going to make based upon the feedback from your evaluation in this cyclical process so that you can go back to redesigning the curriculum, redesigning the objectives. It's this cyclical process. There are always key questions that you want to ask in terms of curriculum design. What should be done? What subject matter should be included? What instructional strategies, resources, and activities should be employed? And what methods and instruments should be used to appraise and assess the results of the curriculum? Now we're going to look at various ideologies in this course. These ideologies will have different answers for this question, for these questions. There's always the difference between the intended and the descriptive uh, curriculum. The intended curriculum is what ought to happen. These ideologies we're going to look at have very different ideas on the intended curriculum. The descriptive curriculum is what actually happens in the actual real world classroom. And as has been discussed in your readings, and as we're going to talk about a great deal in this course, of course, you have to um, consider the hidden curriculum. Um, what hidden messages, hidden signals are students receiving in this descriptive part of your curriculum um, that might tell the students whether they matter or not as whole people, um, whether their rights and justices and voice matter or not, um, whether you care about their needs and interests or not. We're going to look, first of all, at some competing ideologies. This is an introductory um, look at it. We'll look at uh, these ideologies in a great deal more detail as we go further in this course. Perennialism, often referred to also as scholar-academic ideology, sometimes also referred to as humanism. Uh, there's a social efficiency ideology, uh, sometimes called essentialism. There is learner-centered ideology, sometimes also called progressivism, which is problematic because progressivism is kind of hard to define when you really look at the history of progressive movement. And there is social construction. That's why I, I, by the way, I focus on the word learner-centered rather than progressive um, in most of this course. And there's also the social reconstructionist ideology. Social reconstructionist ideology uh, relates to things like social justice, civil rights movement in schools. The perennialist ideology, sometimes also referred to as scholar academic, um, deals, and that's the first one we'll look at in our little mini units on each of these ideologies. Um, deals with the aim of education as being to ensure that students acquire understandings of the great ideas in Western civilization, going back to Shakespeare, the Greeks, the Romans, what shaped Western civilization. Now, when we talk about a perennialist perspective that's even more focused on the United States, um, then you focus on um, understanding the great ideas of the United States as a society and the United States writers and United States thinkers and an emphasis on U.S. civics. Um, so when you hear um, people um, trying to say that our curriculum needs to make sure that students have an idea of what it means to be an American um, with this often patriotic way of looking at, um, as the advocates would define patriotism, um, then oftentimes that is linked to a perennialist or scholar academic approach to curriculum. 
it focuses on things like cultural literacy. What I mean by cultural literacy in the perennialist sense would be uh, this idea that there is certain core knowledge of great ideas in the United States and great ideas in Western civilization that everyone should know to be culturally literate. Um, this uh, comes from the thinking of people like Edie Hirsch that we'll look at uh, later in this course. And it also places a great deal of emphasis on specific content and specific disciplines. Um, there are some key names. We'll look at the writings of Mortimer Adler later uh, with one of the great books in Western civilization that Adler argued everyone should read. E. Hirsch did something very similar in the 1980s and 1990s with his list of great books that he felt like people should read to be culturally literate. Scholar academic emphasizes the way that lasting truths of great thinkers of the past should be emphasized and put forward in the curriculum. It stresses certain contents such as STEM, classics of literature, the, uh, the core of reading and writing skills that are more important than other. Um, some content that can sometimes be de-emphasized might include um shop and might include uh, a curriculum that is more toward the end of uh, skills to be a, a tradesman for instance and that's why there's sort of sometimes some arguments between this curriculum one phrase behind uh, the scholar academic ideology would be the best uh, curriculum for the best in society should be available for all in society. In other words, if students of Harvard and I relate prep schools, for instance, are learning um, certain great ideas and great thinking and Latin and Greek and so forth, then why shouldn't everyone? Okay, moving on to social efficiency, otherwise known often as essentialism. Uh, this approach is largely dominant in American schools. It's this approach where you get, uh, for instance, the emphasis on high stakes testing. Um, you've heard of Common Core. Common Core is very much related uh, to a social efficiency outlook. Uh, so social efficiency argues that there's a common core of knowledge that needs to be transmitted to students in a very systematic and very disciplined way often backed up by a regime of high stakes testing. Uh, the core curriculum is essential knowledge and skills and academic rigor. When you hear uh, this back to basics movement and idea, for instance, in the reading field, that students are lacking uh, phonics skills and students uh, in, in early childhood need to get back to the basics of phonics first instruction in reading classrooms, um, that's tied to a social efficiency outlook. Um, drawing on Popham, uh, who we'll study later in this course. Uh, curriculum um, is all planned learning outcomes for which the school is responsible. Curriculum refers to the desired consequences of instruction. Uh, for a social efficiency, there is an emphasis on consequences, outcomes that can be assessed. There is an emphasis in social efficiency on a scientific approach to curriculum design, um, using the scientific method uh, to design curriculum. Um, you want curriculum uh, and um, approaches to curriculum and outcomes that are observable and quantifiable and measurable. Next, we'll study learner-centered and progressive instruction, and this is basically the sequence that we'll go along in, in the course, although we will look at, we'll intersperse all these uh, during the course to compare and contrast as we move forward too. But our third unit in this course will center on learner-centered instruction. Typically, um, learner-centered instruction is referred to as progressive approaches to instruction but as we'll study in this course, it's a little bit problematic because the progressive movement in the 1920s, 30s, 40s was a very big tent. And, um, that, and it's, so it's a little bit hard to uh, disaggregate uh, the learner-centered approach from what became the social efficiency approach when we look back to the 1930s and 40s. Um, 
So the term progressivism, even though I'm using it here because you'll see that in a lot of your books and a lot of your um, readings and conversations as you move on throughout your entire career and for the rest of your life, whenever you hear the term progressive education, it tends to be associated with the learner-centered approach. So I want you to understand that, but I also understand that historically speaking, progressivism is much bigger um, than it's often talked about. Okay, so education according to the learner-centered approach associated with people like Maria Montessori and John Dewey and Lev Vygotsky. Um, education should focus, should focus on the whole child rather than just simply specific content as the scholar academics would advise, um, or rather than on the society or the teacher as um, the perennialists would advise. Um, the learner is understood as being a problem solver and a thinker who works through real world problems. Um, effective teachers are basically guides um, who guide students through experiences so they can learn by doing. That's a very Deweyan way of looking at it and Montessori uh, does that too. Curriculum content is derived from students' interests and questions. Um, you've heard of the term developmentally appropriate practices. That's um, from the learner-centered approach in many ways. So all of these approaches do uh, influence curriculum that you're going to be put into, putting into action as a teacher. A Deweyan outlook on the curriculum is the curriculum is a continuous reconstruction moving from the child's present experience out into um, that represented by the organized bodies of truth that we call studies. The various studies are themselves experience. They are that of the, of the, of the race, the human race he's talking about here, um, broadly the human race. So um, notice something here. The curriculum is continuously shaped, continuously reconstructed by the experiences and interests of the child. It's not the, ch um, the, the content of the curriculum doesn't come before the child. The child shapes the content. Um, that's an important thing to understand. Further with the learner-centered curriculum, uh, some things that it emphasizes, it studies how students learn, it studies how students form attitudes, it studies how students generate ideas. The learner-centered approach tends to emphasize things like motivation and engagement, and it emphasizes how students develop values. Next, we get into social reconstructionism. Now, there's a very fine line, as we'll see later in this course, between learner-centered and social reconstructionism. Here's the deal. Social reconstructionism is learner-centered. Um, if you deal with the approaches and the curriculum and the teaching methods of social reconstructionism, you will see approaches to instruction that are very much learner-centered. The difference is that social reconstruction takes the next step of emphasizing questioning issues of social justice and injustice and questioning what's right, what's wrong in society, what, what do we need to change society and a view of the school as change agent, the view of the teacher as change agent. That's the key difference between learner-centered and social reconstructionist. Where things get blurred a little bit is a lot of the scholars will look at that are learner-centered, that we classify traditionally as learner-centered, do take an interest in Reconstructionist issues. For instance, Dewey would be traditionally uh, put in the school of thought of, of learner-centered. Uh, but Dewey also, he strongly influenced all of these schools of thought. Uh, Dewey wrote a lot about assessment, a lot about how to organize the curriculum that emphasized the, what became the social efficiency movement. Uh, Dewey did value the learning of great ideas uh, the, from Western society. For instance, he was very influenced by German philosophy in his own dissertation and his own, in his own studies. So in that way, Dewey emphasized the scholar academics. Uh, Dewey had a very strong influence, especially as he got older, um, on 
issues of social justice in society. For instance, when the Great Depression of the 1930s hit, uh, Dewey uh, became a socialist, uh, someone who believes in the government taking an active role in the redistribution of goods and services in society. Um, and he started writing more and more about issues of social justice and injustice in society. But um, one reason why he is always classified as a learner-centered instead of Reconstructionist is, number one, Dewey um, consistently, when you come back to his intellectual home base, if you will, his heart, uh, Dewey was always focused on what we talk about with learner-centered instruction. Um, number two, the Reconstructionists would argue that Dewey did not go far enough uh, for instance, on when it comes to the issues of social justice, for instance, Dewey was living in a time period when uh, there was a great deal of violence uh, committed against um, people with black and brown skin. Um, a great deal of a great deal of lynching took place during Dewey's lifetime. Um, if you were to read Ida B. Wells, you'll find a great deal of discussion about lynching. If you were to um, read others, you'll find a great deal about lynching. Uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, for instance. Um, but and Wells, as well as Du Bois, would be classified as social reconstructionists. You read all of Dewey's collected works, which would be a lot. He was very prolific. You won't find him talking about lynching within his books. And um, and so there are those who would say, okay, that's something you really should have been writing about, Dewey. Um, so again, that's a big difference. It's a difference in degree. It's a difference in scope. It's a difference in major emphasis. Um, the social reconstructionists put a strong emphasis on looking at who is oppressed who is privileged, and what can we do to address issues of oppression in order to improve human conditions. Uh, for instance, going back to World War II, um, Theodore uh, Vermeld uh, took a look at the way that changing technologies, including weaponry, uh, was uh, a source of annihilation. So how can technology um, either assist human cruelty or assist human betterment and beneficence. George Counts argued, um, especially during the time period of the Great Depression, that education was a means toward preparing people for creating a new social order. He wrote a very influential book called Dare the School Build a New Social Order. Paul Freire will look at him a great deal um, when we look at the social reconstructionist unit of this course. He was a Brazilian um, reformer and educator um, who championed education and literacy, reading, writing skills as a vehicle for social change. He argued that people must learn to resist oppression rather than become victims and rather than oppress others. He argued that dialogue as well as what he called critical consciousness um, or the development of awareness to overcome domination and oppression is a critical aspect of schooling. Um, he argued that um, instead of just simply depositing um, knowledge in students um, as if they are empty um, banks to be deposited, um, then we should encourage students to be involved in an active process of inquiry, which they themselves are in a constant state of creation, of uh, construction of their own knowledge and inventing and reinventing the world and society. For uh, the Reconstructionist, society is viewed as a source for curriculum design. You take a look at what's going on in the communities, local as well as national, and you take a look at what needs to change. Uh, curriculum ideas are drawn from an analysis of the social situation um, and often fosters democracy, um, making um, the school as a, democ a democratizing force. Now, the thing is, when it comes to that phrase, um, within the United States, each of these ideologies would argue that they are in favor of the curriculum um, being a democratizing force, but they go about it in different ways. 
each of these um, types of ideologies look at moral doctrines as an important aspect of informing curriculum design. And we'll look at that further in a different discussion. But some key questions need to be asked. Um, what is the nature of justice? What is the nature of equity, for instance? Each of these ideologies would answer those questions a little bit differently. Spirituality is looked upon um, within many of these curriculum. For instance, private schools and home schools um, will, of course, emphasize religious texts, including the Bible, as a source of infor informing curriculum design. Um, now, depending on that point of view, some people that emphasize religious texts would be one of these curriculum designs rather than the other. It would be rare for someone, um, extremely rare for someone who takes a spirituality and a religious text point of view, um, to be a social efficiency advocate. Um, it is possible like um, and commonplace actually for some, for one of these um, advocates of biblical based instruction to maybe be learner centered. Um, the scholar academic, especially the very conservative aspect of perennialist approach sometimes does go hand in hand with a Bible based approach to schooling. On the other hand, there are approaches uh, to understanding theology that are very social reconstructionist also. And those approaches would go hand in hand with, of course, the social reconstructionist approach to curriculum design. Now, there are some educators and um, scholars that emphasize spirituality in forming the curriculum in not necessarily religious ways. Remember, um, spirituality doesn't necessarily mean adherence to a theological text. Uh, so, for instance, James Moffat um, argued that educators need to be mindful, they need to be attentive and aware of the outside world, they need to be self-aware, continuously involved in introspection and self-examination, empathetic, compassionate, and promote the welfare of others. And we always need to be looking at what is the nature of knowledge, we'll look at that in a different discussion further when it comes to philosophy. What's the nature of knowledge and how does that shape curriculum design? For instance, what knowledge is most worth? These different ideologies answer that question in different ways. For whom is this knowledge of value? Again, different answers depending on which um, ideology you adhere to. Is there any knowledge that must be possessed by the majority of students? That's a question that, of course, you see being asked um, by the perennialists. What intellectual skills must be taught to enable knowledge to be utilized for individual and social good? You've got different answers there. For instance, the social efficiency ideology would argue that we need to make sure that uh, children can be competitive in society and, and that um, and that America is competitive on the world stage in terms of skills. That's a major talking point within the social efficiency ideology. We next need to look at different types of curriculum. The recommended curriculum, the written curriculum, the supported curriculum, the taught curriculum, the tested curriculum, and the learned curriculum. When we talk about the recommended curriculum, that's, for instance, what do scholars, the collection of scholars like myself in a certain field of thought, um, recommend that teachers put into motion? Or what do professional organizations such as Na National Council for Teachers of English for English teachers, or ILA, International Literacy Association for reading teachers, what do they recommend for the curriculum? Sometimes when we talk about the recommended curriculum, we're also under more force of law, of course, talking about what does the federal government or what does the state recommend? Now that has force of law. Um, for instance, when we talk about the state standards uh, within Arkansas, that deals with, of course, the recommended curriculum. When we talk about things that are encouraged by Every Student Succeeds Act, uh, which under the Obama administration replaced No Child Left Behind, um, that gets into the recommended curriculum. Next, we get into the written curriculum um, that takes the um, 
recommended to the next step in more detail and it gets into written sets of goals that are going to be accomplished. It will encourage a rationale. Why are we doing this? General goals to be accomplished. Then from general, it gets into more specific objectives that need to be mastered by students. Sequence of how these objectives will be studied as well as what kinds of activities will be used. That's all the written curriculum. The supported curriculum gets into what resources are allocated and available to support uh, the curriculum. How much time is available for a certain subject? How much time does a classroom teacher provide for the studying of a subject? What's the class size? Um, what textbooks and other learning materials are available? Next, we get into the taught curriculum. This is the curriculum that's actually delivered. Um, this is what, if you're stepping into a teacher's classroom, for instance, if you're um, doing your field experiences or clinical experiences as a student, what would you actually observe? That's the taught curriculum. Then we get into the tested curriculum or the learned curriculum. The tested curriculum is uh, deals with what's uh, the student learning that is actually assessed. Um, there's different forms of assessment out there. Formative assessment would be a, a type of assessment that is given as students are learning, um, and the um, and the and then of course you've got assessments that are given for instance high stakes assessments or assessments at the end of a unit of instruction, and then of course you've got the learned curriculum, what the student understands and what they retained. Ideally, the tested curriculum should uh, shed light on the learned curriculum, but that's not always the case because frankly, some of our tests are not used properly and some of our tests are a little bit problematic. So then you've sometimes got these areas where the learned curriculum, we have a hard time even seeing what it is. You've got different dimensions to the, to the curriculum next, we're gonna talk about that. Scope, sequence, continuity, integration, articulation, and balance. And oftentimes, if, and especially scope and sequence, um, it, when you become a working teacher, and I realize um, most of you have not been full-time um, certified teachers yet, but oftentimes when you're teaching in school full-time, you will often hear talk about the scope and sequence of the curriculum. So this is very critical for you to um, study. Scope deals with the breadth and depth of the curriculum, wide and deep. So um, it deals with the content, the topics, the learned experiences, and the organizing threads, the connections the, um, of the curriculum. Going back to Tyler there. Uh, and when you see Tyler, think, of course, of uh, social efficiency movement. Educational experiences created to, uh, to engage students in learning. When you see engagement, think learner-centered. Uh, so one thing I want you to notice, I want you to be have a critical eye on this sort of wording uh, when it comes to these ideologies, because even though I'm telling you that social efficiency is very much dominant in schools because of the force of law with standards and testing regimes and Every Student Succeeds Act and state legislation that supports it, uh, even though, yes, that is true, all four of these approaches to curriculum that we're going to be studying have had a pretty deep influence on curriculum that you're going to be putting into action as a teacher. Um, the scope includes cognitive, affective, and psychomotor domains. We'll study that more when it comes to Bloom's taxonomy. Um, and it includes um, lesson plans. How do you organize information? Then we get into sequence of the curriculum. The sequence should be continuous and it should be cumulative. It deals with content and experiences that build upon what came before. So what comes first, what comes second, that's sequence. It, um, when we get into how to plan the sequence of a curriculum, we often draw upon Piaget's understanding of stages of development of, of learning and stages of development of thinking. Piaget is very influential to uh, approaches to sequencing curriculum that are um, emphasized in most districts. 
we get into also issues of simple to complex learning, prerequisite learning, hold apart learning, as well as chronological learning also when we come to sequencing. When we talk about a sequencing curriculum from simple to complex, we'll talk about the easier content to learn, oftentimes very concrete, uh, and then we get into more abstract ideas. When we talk about true prerequisite concern, uh, learning, we have to think about what learning must be understood first before we can talk about what comes next. Uh, that's why, for instance, on your college courses, we've, all, we've always got prerequisite courses. The reason there are certain prerequisite courses are that we as educators believe that you need to have certain knowledge before you can even um, understand, even really tackle the knowledge that comes in a certain in, a, in the next course within the sequence. Hold apart deals with uh, content or experiences that must first be presented as an overview to provide students with a general idea of information. So you start with a big picture, then you burrow it down. Then of course, chronological sequence um, deals with, of course, um, real world occurrences. Uh, so if you're going to be teaching history, oftentimes you teach history chronologically, 1920s and 1930s. Sequence also deals with, of course, concept related or inquiry related or learning related or utilization related sequence of events and sequences in the curriculum. Uh, drawing here on Gerald Posner. Concept related sequence means that you're focusing on concepts and their interrelationships. For instance, the interrelationship between ideas within a history curriculum. Um, so if you're going to study the big idea of democracy, what are the interrelated concepts that will help um, students understand the concept of what democracy means? Um, inquiry related um, would involve students being involved in an investigation to understand something. Learner related sequences based upon way students experience content and activities in a real world um, type of context. Sometimes these can be um, interrelated. You can have inter, uh, inquiry related and learner related. Uh, utilization related uh, focuses on how people use knowledge and engage in particular activity in the real world. And again, these are instructional choices that you make as a teacher. Which of these sequences do you want to emphasize for a particular reason in a particular course? Continuity is very important to consider when it comes to sequencing. Continuity deals with ideas and skills that educators feel students should develop over time and how these ideas will reappear oftentimes in greater depth um, over the length of, of the curriculum. Um, for instance, if reading skills are an important objective, then you want to emphasize um, opportunities for these skills to be practiced and developed. That's what continuity is all about. Integration deals with linking various types of knowledge around experiences contained within the curriculum. Linking the piece of the curriculum together so that students see the curriculum as consisting of a unified whole. Um, oftentimes when we talk about units of instruction as opposed to just lessons of instruction, that's all about integration. Making sure that students see how one lesson um, integrates, ties into the next lesson from Monday through Friday. And oh, we're coming to the end here. Articulation deals with relationships between components that occur later in a curriculum um, to the beginning. So oftentimes if you're teaching trigonometry, you might relate the material in a trigonometry course back to what students learned previously within geometry and algebra. And finally, we come to balance within a curriculum that deals with ways that students can acquire and use knowledge in ways that advance personal goals, personal, social, or intellectual goals. So this helps students see the curriculum as meaningful and useful. Okay, hopefully you found this um, beneficial to you. This went by quick. I want you to always want benefit to you as I give you a PowerPoint so that you can um, review it. I'm also going to be giving you some uh, material that 
will help you study these uh, these concepts in deeper ways. But this is only the beginning of the course. Um, we're going to be studying these concepts much more as we go along. Uh, so if some of this sounds a little bit, if you're feeling a little bit confused, potentially, hopefully you don't, hopefully this comes across very clear to you, uh, at least what the definitions of these terms are. This is meant just basically as an introduction to some ideas that we're going to be studying later in this course. I believe that it's very important for you to understand the concepts, understand the debate within these ideas, in order to also study how are you going to put together your lesson plans, how are you going to put together your curriculum design, and why. Okay, have a good night, have a good day, whichever it is when you're watching this. Be well.